Hello, my name is Tim and I'm a PhD student at the School of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford. Today I'll be introducing you to the topic of biogeomorphology. This topic builds on research from a variety of disciplines including geography, engineering, archaeology, biology and chemistry. Therefore, whether you study science, art or the humanities, the topic of biogeomorphology should be of interest to you. Here are the learning objectives for today's lecture. So to begin with, what is biogeomorphology? Well, like most fields of research, its name reveals a lot. Bio comes from the ancient Greek word for life, bios. Geo means earth, more means shape, and ology means the study of. If we rearrange all these meanings, we end up with a basic definition. Biogeomorphology is the study of how life influences the shape of the earth. Alternatively, we could use the definition by Professor Heather Viles, who first formalised the term in the late 1980s. Biogeomorphology is concerned with the influence of plants, animals and microorganisms on earth surf processes and the development of landforms. There are three main biogeomorphological processes, bioconstruction, bioprotection and bioerosion. There are direct and indirect examples of each process and the relationship between these processes is often varied and complex, with more than one often occurring concurrently in the same environment. For example, in a rocky coastal environment, you may come across bioconstructions in the form of reefs created by honeycomb worms, as well as bioprotective organisms such as seaweed, which can form bioprotective canopies over rocky surfaces, and bioerosive organisms such as limpets, which graze and erode the surface of rock. Understanding how these processes work and the rate and magnitude of these three processes in different environments is the primary aim of biogeomorphological research. So let's look at each of these three main processes in a bit more detail. Firstly, bioconstruction. Before I continue, I'll give you five seconds to guess what has been shown in this satellite picture. This image shows the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. Coral reefs such as the Great Barrier Reef, are an excellent example of a bioconstruction. The process of bioconstruction involves the production of sedimentary deposits, accretions or accumulations by organic means and may involve both active and passive organic influences. Essentially, bioconstructions are landforms constructed by animals, plants and other organisms. As suggested in the definition, bioconstructions can develop in a variety of ways. Firstly, organisms can produce material themselves. This is the case for coral reefs, which are formed from colonies of coral polyps that are held together by biogenic calcium carbonate secreted by the polyps themselves. Over time, new coral will grow on much older reefs, creating large bioconstructions, which can be several thousands of years old and thousands of kilometres in length. This type of bioconstruction is autogenic, as the bio, biogenic landform is modified for an organism's own structure using living and dead tissue. The second way in which bioconstruction occurs is through the accretion and accumulation of inorganic or non-living material. Organisms such as honeycomb worms, shown in the previous slide, actively create material by chemically fixing particulate matter. In the case of the honeycomb worm, sand and shell fragments are glued together with mucus to create tubes which form the building blocks of honeycomb worm reef systems. This type of bioconstruction can be termed allogenic as landforms are created and modified by transferring non-living materials. Other examples of allogenic bioconstructions include beaver dams, termite mounds and earthworm deposits. 
As you can probably tell from the examples, bioconstructions exhibit a range of forms which vary from massive, long-lived structures such as coral reefs to smaller, short-lived features such as crusts or mounds. In addition to being interesting, bioconstructions can provide a variety of valuable services to humans. Take coral reefs for example. Reef systems help human populations by buffering the impact of coastal storm surges, as well as acting as a tourist attraction. The next important process to consider is bioerosion. The image you see in front of you depicts a group of European bee eaters who create nests by excavating into the sides of slopes. This is a type of active bioerosion, which involves the direct weathering or removal of material by an organism. Other types of direct bioerosion include when sea urchins bore into coastal rocks to create favourable habitats, when elephants rub against rocks and trample hardwood, leading to the production of sediment, and when roots of plants grow into the fissures of rocks, causing them to fracture. In many of these cases, the bioeroding organisms break down hard material into smaller constituent components, transfer, transforming bedrock to soil and sand. In addition to direct bioerosion, organisms can contribute to the breakdown of material through passive means or indirect bioerosion. Indirect bioerosion reduces the level of protection from other erosive processes, thus indirectly facilitating the deterioration or transport of material and sediment. Examples of indirect bioerosion include when animals consume vast amounts of vegetation, which otherwise would bind sediment together, making it more susceptible to erosion from flowing water. Another example of indirect bioerosion includes when darkly coloured lichens increases the surface temperature of the rock it grows on. The increased surface temperature of the rock underneath the lichen can enhance weathering processes, thus increasing the rate of rock breakdown. The final biogeomorphological process we need to consider is bioprotection. Bioprotection can be defined as the active or passive roles of organisms in preventing or retarding the action of erosional or weathering processes. Like bioerosion, it has an active or direct element and a passive or indirect element. One way in which plants such as trees directly protect the erosion of sediment is through their roots. As shown in this picture, trees that grow on sloped hillsides or verges prevent the erosion of sediment by actively binding the soil together. Another example of active bioprotection includes when lichen, which grows on the surface of rocks, forms a protective layer. Interestingly, types of black lichen, such as the one shown in this picture at high magnification, and the ones shown on the previous slide have been found to have both bioprotective and bioerosive properties. The bioprotective layer they form may reduce erosion, or alternatively, it may increase the efficiency of some weathering processes, such as thermal stress, due to its dark colour, which increases the temperature of rock surfaces. Indirect forms of bioprotection include when seagrass plants and mangroves aid sedimentation in shallow marine environments and buffer wave energy, thus helping to create a protected series of habitats for a range of marine species. Since we have now looked at all the main biogeomorphological processes, why don't you have a go at identifying potential biogeomorphological activity? What kinds of biogeomorphological processes do you think could be occurring in this rocky intertidal environment? Remember, more than one process can occur in the same environment at the same time. I will give you 30 seconds to have a go. Now, I would argue that perhaps the most obvious process that is on show is bioconstruction. Mussels can form dense beds several centimetres thick as individual organisms attach themselves to the underlying rock. These beds provide a unique habitat for smaller understory intertidal organisms and create additional hard surfaces 
for other muscles to attach to. In addition, however, I would also argue that muscle beds have the potential to protect the underlying rock from erosive processes such as wave action and salt weathering. In this sense, processes of bioprotection may also be occurring within this image. Water retaining features characteristic of the muscle beds may dampen the extremes in temperatures experienced by underlying rock during low tide periods, thus reducing the efficiency of some deteriorative weathering processes such as thermal stress. Conversely, the same water retaining features may act, as, may act to increase rock breakdown by enhancing chemical weathering processes. As such, bioerosion may also be occurring in addition to bioprotection and bioconstruction. One of the challenges of a biogeomorphologist like myself is to try and identify which of these processes may be occurring and how these small scale changes can lead to the formation of landforms and shape the wider landscape. So, hopefully by now you understand the importance of biogeomorphology in the formation of geomorphological landforms at a range of scales. Now, this is all very good, but what practical benefits do we get from studying these processes? Well, the short answer is many. But to prove my points, I will introduce you to two examples. Firstly, I will consider the influence of biogeomorphological research on the conservation of historic buildings. Until recently, ivy was thought to damage historic buildings. As a consequence, ivy has been removed from many historic buildings, such as Netley Abbey, a ruined late medieval monastery near Southampton, which is shown in this picture. Recent scientific studies have, however, begun to change this view. Biogeomorphological researchers from the University of Oxford have found that in some cases, ivy can act as a bioprotective agent. For example, ivy is now known to protect historic structures from weathering processes through the regulation of near surface microclimates and by absorbing potentially damaging dust particles. Other organisms that grow in historic structures, such as microbial biofilms, are also known to provide regulatory services as they form layers or rock varnishes on historic structures that can stabilise the surface and protect it from weathering agents such as salt. For my second example, I will consider how research into biogeomorphological processes on Earth may help us identify signs of life on Mars and other interstellar, interstellar bodies. Now, if you search the internet, you will come across some pretty wacky theories for evidence of life on Mars. In reality, it is unlikely that we will discover extraterrestrial life forms in a fully grown human-like state. Instead, biogeomorphologists have suggested that some of the first signatures of alien life may come from the landforms they modify. At a very small scale, this may include boreholes created by microbial-like creatures we regularly see on Earth. At the other end of the spectrum, biological life may present itself in the form of large scale braided channels, which on Earth are regularly shaped by vegetation. Although still very much in its infancy, research which seeks to identify biogeomorphological signatures on the surface of Mars and other interstellar bodies represent exciting progress for the field of biogeomorphology. So to summarise, Biogeomorphology is the study of how plants, animals and organisms influence the formation of landforms at a variety of scales. The three main processes are bioconstruction, bioerosion and bioprotection. Biogeomorphological research has many uses, including the conservation of heritage buildings and potentially helping to identify life on Mars. To end with, I'd like to leave you with a few questions to think about. Firstly, what biogeomorphological processes can you identify around where you live? When considering this question, you may want to first think about the type of environment you live in and the wildlife that can be found in this environment. Are you near a forested, coastal or urban environment? You then may want to consider what, what material biogeomorphic processes could be operating on. This could be soil, rock or even man-made construction materials such as concrete. Finally, you may want to think about which process may be occurring. Is it likely to be bioconstruction, 
by erosion or by protection. The second question I will leave you with is, how does the impact of biogeomorphological processes compare to other geomorphic processes and human activity? For this question, you may want to consider where biogeomorphological processes fit in this temporal and spatial scale I've provided below. Perhaps go back through this talk and have a go at placing the examples I've provided on the graph. How do your own impacts on the Earth's surfaces compare? Finally, here are some useful links in case you want to delve into the topic of biogeomorphology further. Thank you for listening.